necessary people, like affirmative action is a necessary people. I hope that we can level the playing field and that we won't need broader impacts. So in today's talk, I'm going to talk about how I, and I hope, I hope, how many of us can go past narrow criteria, narrow conceptions of users, narrow conceptions of use to have a broader impact for our work. I do this by using a particular methodology. There's a set of fields that I participate in. They're fairly normal sized fields, although I may have more of them than the lucky researchers in the room who have only one field they try to play in. But I use those fields to ask a particular set of questions. And my questions are um, the kind of question that takes us from the individual to the societal and from single visible behaviors to deep societal change. So individual behaviors on this slide is gesture and deep societal change is increased self-esteem among young people. I do this by using a particular methodology and the methodology starts on the left. That is, I start with people and starting with people rather than widgets often allows us to evoke issues that have to do with people in the world and issues that are of benefit to society. This is a very interdisciplinary methodology. It involves looking at human-human interaction and extracting from it what is important, what is generalizable, what is necessary to human communication. And it turns that set of um, uh, videotapes into algorithms that can be used to implement various kinds of things, in this example, virtual humans. The interdisciplinarity, I would argue, leads to diverse teams in terms of discipline. And the focus on real world problems seems to engage a more diverse set of researchers in terms of age, in terms of ethnicity, gender, background, ableness. And all of this, I would argue, and importantly, leads to better basic science. So let me show how that works in terms of an example. I um, have been very interested in uh, dialogue systems, in computational linguistics dialogue systems for a very long time. And one strand of my research looks at how to build dialogue systems that aren't capable only of task talk, like put the flywheel there, but also small talk and storytelling. And in thinking about storytelling, I became interested in the role of storytelling in children's development. And from there, in the topic of literacy. Literacy is a huge unsolved problem in the United States and one where remarkably little technological support exists. In particular, I was struck by how little progress we've made in the education of children who come to school speaking a different language or a different dialect. And this contemplation of this problem led me to ask a set of questions. How can we implement dialogue systems that don't just speak the kind of mainstream academic English that we're used to speaking? How can we build dialogue systems that speak and act in a variety of culturally authentic ways? How can we build avatars and virtual humans that don't perpetuate noxious stereotypes of identity? All too easy to do. Not how to avoid it, but how to do it. How do we use linguistic and cultural diversity to support learning as opposed to destroy learning? And how do we build robust embodied dialogue systems that interact in human-like ways with a variety of different kinds of people? The solution my students and I came up with is a virtual peer, a virtual child, life-sized eight or nine-year-old who interacts with children. This virtual peer is built on the basis of a two-year ethnography in predominantly African-American classrooms in Chicago, classrooms where the dominant dialect spoken is African-American English. And you can tell that we needed an uh, interdisciplinary team to do this kind of work. We decided that in order to avoid unintentioned, well-intentioned, but horrible stereotypes of ethnicity, we would implement a virtual human whose appearance is ethnicity ambiguous. And we tested this iteratively in t until the um, African-American children thought it was African-American and the white children thought it was white and the girls thought it was a girl and the boys thought it was a boy. We threw gender in there as well. <laughs> and it works because researchers are always saying to me, it's a girl, it's a girl. Female researchers are always saying that. 
What we discovered was that when Alex speaks mainstream American English, so did the children. And when Alex signals another social context, the context of the classroom, children speak more mainstream American English and use more evidence-based causal reasoning-oriented science talk than they do when Alex acts as a peer. All that shifted is the social context. It's the same interlocutor. What's fascinating about this is that teachers are hammering away at these children all day, every day. And the teachers told us that this particular group of children was incapable of using mainstream American English. And that's clearly false. And we believe that there's something about power in the classroom that allows the children to do this. I'm going to finish by saying that this broader impact, this benefit to society, has led to a leap in our basic science. It's led us to have to do a particular kind of probabilistic modeling to generate utterances for the virtual peer to say. We can't do natural language speech understand or speech recognition and natural language understanding on African American English today. And so we use our huge corpus of child-child language to probabilistically model the utterances that Alex should produce, and it works. So thank you very much. I hope that soon one day um, American society will recognize the value of science. I found it horrifying that Jeanette said that we're doing this because Americans don't know science is important. That's a problem. Broader impact is not a solution. It's a recognition of a problem. And I hope that scientists will also come to recognize the benefit of society. Thank you.